The story today sounds like it's straight out of a Hollywood thriller. And even though it did inspire some filmmakers, the real story is far more disturbing. Jeffrey McDonald was a true crime star of his time. He cemented his celebrity status in the 80s after a best-selling book, Fatal Vision, was published, followed by a movie of the same title, a TV miniseries, and documentaries. He told a horrifying story of how Charles Manson-style hippies raided his house and brutally murdered his wife and daughters. But Jeffrey is believed to have been the real killer and staged the crime scene to implicate a bloody Manson-like slaughter. The question that is still up for debate by some is whether he's a cold-blooded murderer or a victim of bloodthirsty hippies on acid. But the fact is, this savage slaying of his wife and daughters left the nation horrified. Welcome to 10-Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe. I'm the host of this podcast, and I really appreciate you being here today. If this is your first time listening, I'm excited that you're here and you picked a really good episode to start on. And now that spooky season is over, we're entering a new season, my least favorite season. It's when you wake up and go to work and it's dark outside, and you come home from work and it's dark outside. That in-between time is the only sunshine, and we don't get any part of it. The exception is you third shift workers. And you third shift workers, I love you, but you're weird. You're like vampires. You're sleeping during the day and you're working at night and you're taking a lunch break at like 2.30 a.m. It's weird. You know it's weird and I know it's weird. I think my body would rebel against me and I'd have to find a quiet closet to take a nap in. And speaking of, I do need to say hello to this one group of third shift nurses. They listen all the time to this podcast. And I don't want to say your names or where you work because I don't want to get you in trouble, but Thank you for listening. Go check that call bell. You can even pause it right here. I'll wait for you when you come back. Okay, good. You're back. Now we can get started. But before we do, make sure you subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media. Links are in the show notes of this episode, as well as at 10minutemurder.com. Now to the story. Jeffrey McDonald was born October 12, 1943, in Jamaica, Queens, New York. He grew up in a poor neighborhood on Long Island and was raised by a pretty strict father who wasn't shy about discipline. His father demanded obedience and achievements from his family, but remained nonviolent toward his wife and kids. Just a really strict dad. And according to the neighbors, McDonald did not demonstrate any violent behavior when he was young. His school teachers mentioned that he was intelligent and a quiet student. However, we hear this same thing in many of the true crime cases when the subject is a narcissist or has a hero complex, like mentioned in the recent Angel of Death episode. Even though Jeffrey did not have an effortless start, he found his way among his peers pretty quickly. Being quite popular in high school, it wasn't a surprise when he became the student council president. He was crowned the king of the senior prom, and was chosen by his peers as both most popular and the most likely to succeed student. And he certainly did well in terms of popularity later in life, too. Attractive and social, Jeffrey quickly found himself a serious girlfriend, Colette Stevenson. They were together for about a year. After splitting ways and going to two different colleges, the feelings they had before eventually sparked again. And then, surprise, Colette is pregnant. The couple got married in 1963. McDonald, following his admission to the U.S. Army in 1969, along with his high school sweetheart wife and two small daughters, moved into a row house in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which, BTW, is where I was born. The base gave him a place to live, and Colette became pregnant for a third time with the couple's first son. Jeffrey started as a physician and rose to the rank of captain within one year. His charisma grabbed attention, and everyone from the community seemed to know who he was, the McDonald family became pretty well-known. Everything seemed to be going just fine. Jeffrey was making a career, and the Army had everything taken care of in terms of livelihood. People that knew them thought that they might just be the model couple. But behind closed doors, they argued pretty often. On February 17, 1970, in the early morning, Fort Bragg dispatchers received an emergency call from the McDonald residence. On the other end of the line was Jeffrey. Help. 544 Castle Drive, stabbing, 
544 Castle Drive, stabbing, hurry. When the police arrived at Castle Drive, they discovered McDonald and his wife in the bedroom, the wounded man of the house and his 25-year-old wife, who was lifeless, in the bedroom. Colette was on her back, on the floor, with one eye open and one breast exposed. The word pig was written in her blood on their headboard. She was badly beaten and bludgeoned with a piece of wood. What's worse, she was stabbed 21 times with an ice pick and 16 times with a knife. She was still pregnant at the time. Keep in mind, this wasn't a time too far removed from the Manson family murders, maybe just eight or nine months or so from that, where Pig, among other things, was written on the walls. The speculation is that he was trying to make it seem as though this was another of those cult murders. In their beds upstairs, the kids' bodies were also found to be dead. Kimberly, who was five years old, was bludgeoned with a piece of wood as well and stabbed in the neck ten times. The younger toddler, Kristen, was stabbed 33 times with a knife and 15 more times with an ice pick. After being hospitalized, it was stated that none of Jeffrey's wounds were life-threatening. The stab wound in his chest was described as the staff by a clean, small, sharp incision. According to McDonald, he was sleeping on the sofa in the living room when suddenly, around 2 a.m., some guys broke into the house and attacked him and his family. He heard his wife and daughter scream as he was being knocked out. When he awakened after the intruders left, he unsuccessfully attempted to revive his family. The investigation found that there was not a single piece of evidence of the alleged perpetrators described by the, air quotes, survivor. He claimed it was two white men, one African-American man and a white woman that could have been a man disguised as a woman, as Jeffrey continues to suggest. Despite maintaining a calm and professional manner, McDonald has left some clues behind. The murder weapons were found in the house's backyard, with their fingerprints strangely removed, pointing to a killer who never left the property. Further investigation also presented conclusions that greatly contradicted Jeffrey's account. And it didn't really help that Jeffrey first was all about taking a polygraph test and then later refused to take it. Pause. The polygraph, I don't really blame him for. I mean, back then, these polygraphs were much more heavily weighted because later we found out that they're about as good as a coin flip on the accuracy, which is why you, in my opinion, should never agree to take one. Either you're innocent and you pass, but they still interrogate you like you're lying because they know that they aren't super accurate, or you're innocent and you fail because you're a bundle of nerves, and then they clamp down on you in the interrogation. They're never going to go, well, he passed, let's let him go. Anyway, with mounting evidence, the authorities redirected their attention to Jeffrey, and on May 1st, 1970, he was officially charged with the murder. During the trial, McDonald's line of defense was to maintain that forensic investigators had overlooked or even destroyed evidence that supported his version of the events. Also, Jeffrey helped to identify a potential suspect, a teenage drug addict named Helena Steckley. Helena seemed to fill in the missing hole in Jeffrey's story, as she was the woman who supposedly chanted, Acid is groovy, and killed the pigs. And there's more to the Helena story, but absolutely none of it is provable. And there wasn't enough evidence to support the accusations against Jeffrey as well, so the charges against him were dropped in October of 1970. After being dismissed from the army, McDonald moved to California, where he worked as a doctor. A charming doctor previously engaged to a mystery murder case received lots of hype. He ended up getting a great deal of exposure in the media, gave many interviews, and made an appearance on television, becoming sort of a true crime celebrity. Jeffrey's casual attitude, despite his tragic loss and the obvious way he enjoyed being the center of attention, raised suspicion among Colette's mourning family. Boastful and full of self-praise, in another episode of Keeping Up With Jeffrey, he started to tell the story about how he managed to track down and murder one of the alleged perpetrators along with one of his army colleagues. And at this point, Colette's stepfather had had enough, so he began his own investigation. Previously, he had believed in the innocence of his ex-son-in-law, but after seeing him 18 hours after the attack, sitting up in his hospital bed, casually eating a meal, with his injuries being pretty minor compared to his wife and kids, along with the fact that Jeffrey began dating a very young woman just a couple of weeks after his family was killed, this new, brash and bold Jeffrey made him have a change of heart. Owing to his investigative efforts, Jeffrey McDonald was brought to court again. In the second trial, Jeffrey once again could not explain multiple inaccuracies in his own account. 
McDonald even hired Joe McGinnis to prove his innocence and support his own self-image as a virtuous man. The problem was that after interviewing McDonald, the author, Joe McGinnis, conducted his own investigation and concluded that the true crime man of the hour was, indeed, guilty. His book, Fatal Vision, came out and Jeffrey was ticked. He even sued the author for fraud, as he was not depicted the way he expected. McDonald was found guilty, given three life sentences in 1979, for being guilty of one count of first-degree murder and two counts of second-degree murder. Jeffrey thought that he had committed the perfect crime and was going to get away with it. As a tall, charming army surgeon who seemed to be the perfect family guy, McDonald initially managed to convince the police that he was the victim. And no one would have guessed that he was capable of such hateful violence. In the book Fatal Vision, McDonald was described as a cold-blooded killer with no remorse. In one of the most heinous crimes of the 1970s, there's still a debate going on whether the dashing Green Beret captain killed his pregnant wife and two daughters. Now, 79-year-old Jeffrey McDonald, whose case has inspired several articles, a best-selling book, and a highly regarded TV movie, and even a segment on Unsolved Mysteries, he still struggles to clear his reputation. He has consistently defended his innocence despite the fact that more than 40 years have passed since his conviction. His efforts to get this case reopened were unsuccessful, and he remains inmate number 00131-177.